Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Olivia. Um, we're about to get started here uh, with an Ask an Outdoor Expert. Uh, sorry, Ask an Outdoor Expert on birding in New York. Uh, let me just bring my guest on here. Uh, my guest on here, Ryan. Let's see. Awesome. Hi, Ryan. Uh, sorry about that. Just had to change the link to the screen here. Um, That's so, okay. Thank you so much for being here tonight. So we have four viewers. Uh, um, okay, great. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Olivia Bernard. Uh, I work for um, the Costco Center for Conservation and Development as a digital experience coordinator. Um, I'm proud to work for an organization that focuses on conservation stewardship in the Capitol region and to be a part of the Capitol Visitor Center in Knox Center, where we provide information and resources for local visitors. Um, the Capital Center hosts an annual event. It's called Taking Flight. It's a three-day conference for birders. Um, it includes science talks, bird walks, and activities for birding enthusiasts of all levels. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, it had, had to be postponed, but is scheduled to return in May 2022. Um, I'm really excited to have as my guest today for Ask an Outdoor Expert, Ryan Mandelbaum, uh, they, them, who is a science writer and a recurring guest on the radio show Science Friday and the American Birding Association podcast. Um, if we wanted to ask them today about physics or quantum computing, we probably could. Um, Ryan is both a member of and a trip leader for the Feminist Bird Club, an organization with chapters across North America and the Netherlands to make birding and the outdoors more inclusive to people who may not have safe or easy access to it. Um, so thank you so much, Ryan, for being here. Uh, and um, uh, I'm really glad that we have some people here as well. So thank you all for, uh, for joining us for Ask an Outdoor Expert. Um, this is going to be a combination of me asking questions. And um, you all are free to also ask questions in the comment box on Facebook. Um, this is going to get uh, posted online after the fact as well. So um, feel free to tune in, um, tune in live or tune in after the fact as well. Uh, so uh, the first question I wanted to ask um, Brian is, uh, why do you, uh, what do you like about birding uh, and how did you first get into it? So it's a long story because I used to be afraid, like afraid of birds and a bird <laughs> not like her. Um, but I, just because I'm from the New York uh, suburbs, so I just didn't have a lot of interaction with birds growing up. Um, mm -hmm. But then I saw Great Blue Heron and I read a story in, in journalism school about how the New York City Audubon Society was using painted lawn flamingos to help attract uh, long-legged wading birds like Great Blue Herons and Great Egrets to uh, an island off the coast of Staten Island. And I just thought that was like really cool. Um, and then I just dove right in and <laughs> got really excited about it. And um, my spouse moved to New York from uh, Minnesota. Hi, Brittany. Uh, they also were really excited about birds and we decided to take on uh, birding as a couple's hobby. And so, you know, it was all history from there. And I like it because I like sort of the, I, it gives me a reason to be outdoors. <clears throat> it's sort of something that New York City is actually really good for, to my surprise. It's it's a really awesome place to see birds. And then uh, I like sort of the solitude of being alone with nothing but the sounds of the birds in my camera. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, birding can be such a, a centering meditative exercise. Um, uh, I wanted to talk briefly about um, the tech website uh, Gizmodo that you write for, and I love that you started a column on Gizmodo called Birdmodo. Um, can you tell the audience more about that? Yeah, so um, I started at Gizmodo uh, back in 20, late 2016, and I was still sort of in my not sure if I liked birds or not phase, uh, but 
kind of as 2017 went on, I dove deep into my liking birds phase and it's quickly stopped being joke posts about birds and started being very earnest and excited posts about the science of birds. Uh, and I eventually started writing so many articles about uh, ornithology and the culture of bird watching and things like that, that they decided that I deserved my own tag and my own landing page for all of the bird articles. And uh, by the time I had left, uh, about three years later after we started that, I think we had written something like 50 or 60 bird posts, if not more. Um, and, you know, it was interesting because some of these posts did not do very well, but some of them people were really excited about. People were really excited about uh, anything that had to do with uh, birds copulating, um, corvids, uh, avian intelligence. And a couple of my posts about like really niche bird watching things, like I had a post about a uh, bird watcher who came to the United States just so that he could enjoy the different gull species that we had here. That one people really liked as well. Cool. Uh, and I'm not super surprised that corvids are a hot topic as well. Uh, and probably copulating is not super surprising. <laughs> uh, but that's pretty funny. Um, there's kind of a unique sense of humor that uh, that birders have that I really appreciate. Um, I don't I don't quite know how to put a, um, a, a pin on it, but it's it's a great a great sense of humor. Um, uh, what other kinds of work um, have you done in the wildlife field? I know you, um, well, can you tell us more about the, um, the Finch Research Network as well? Sure, like a lot of birders, um, I do a lot of citizen science related work, which is mainly just mm -hmm. surveying and counting birds and reporting them to eBird and doing Christmas bird counts. Um, but right now I've been trying, because I've sort of developed a voice and the ability to write about birds, I've been volunteering for a nonprofit called the Finch Research Network. It's uh, essentially uh, it was started by Matt Young, who was, he's well known in the Finch Research world for his uh, work on the Red Cross Bill. And it's just getting off the ground, but essentially is trying to raise awareness for these species. There's a lot of endangered finch species. They're a really weird and interesting group with a whole lot to study. Um, and so what I've mainly been doing is helping them just get their voices heard, writing about finches, um, helping to, yeah, just spread the good word about all the all that is finchy. Uh, and this year is an especially good year for folks who are excited about finches and especially for a nonprofit devoted to finches because um, even some manure birders might know that it's what we call an eruption year, which uh, means that all of the um, cone, the trees in the boreal forest, they actually, a lot of them are synchronized in their food production. So in some years they will produce a lot of seeds and in some years they won't. And so in years that they don't, uh, the finches who would otherwise rely on those seeds for winter food will have to fly elsewhere to get the food. And so you see a lot of finches in these eruption years south of the boreal forest in places like the Catskills, Long Island, across the east and the center of the country, and then sometimes even further afield, like there was a common red pole, which is a kind of finch ended up in New Mexico, things like that. So in general, the eruptions are caused by um, like kind of that buster bumper crop years with, um, with trees producing uh, food for them. Totally. So there's a bunch of species of eastern finches. Um, I think there's this thing called the, because the, it relies on a cyclical tree crop, uh, there's birders who try and predict the behavior and the movement of these finches and what years they're going to fly south and what years they're going to stay put. Uh, and now a lot of these finches are, they all, a lot of them rely on different food sources. So it's hard to know whether it's going to be all of the finches or just some of them. Uh, this year is what some folks are calling a super flight because basically every one of these boreal finches is in the middle of erupting, which basically just means that there was this synchronized crop failure of a lot of different boreal crops. Uh, so the cycles all kind of lined up that there wasn't a lot of food in the boreal forest. And so a lot of these finches, pretty much every, yeah, every species of boreal finch uh, ended up erupting southward right now. So um, huh. My favorite bird is the red cross bill as well. And I was able to find a couple of them in the cemetery really close to my apartment. And then I spent last weekend every, so Friday, Saturday and Sunday, I spent most of the day 
in a pine stand at a local uh, park where I was photographing the Red Cross bills that had shown up and helping people see the Red Cross bills that had shown up and recording them and sending them to the Finch research folks. And it was really fun. Wow, um, those are pretty uncommon birds. That's awesome. <laughs> It was really amazing. And uh, I'll be back next this coming weekend to see if I could spot some more because they were there for me last weekend. Maybe they'll be there for me this weekend. Nice. Um, I noticed a question that came in. Uh, is that related to the Winter Finch report? Um, I think she's talking about uh, the Finch Research Network. Yep. So right now, um, the Finch the winter finch report that she's talking about is has been going on for a couple decades now. Um, it was started by Ron Pitaway, who is this legendary Canadian birder. He's really awesome. And he retired this past year so that he could go, you know, do birding in his own way. And he passed it on to Tyler Hoare, who is another Canadian birder. And uh, Tyler has now hosting the Finch forecast that she's talking about on the uh, Finch Research Network's website. So Tyler Hoare is also a member of the Finch Research Network and uh, has also been kind of keeping track of the finches in the forest. Uh, but yeah, birders are really excited about this Finch forecast because it's like, you know, it's the end of the summer and you're starting to get sad that the warblers are all going to go away and there's no more baby birds. And then, you know, right as sort of migration is starting to settle down in the fall, this this forecast comes out and it kind of makes or breaks your winter because if they say that the finches are all going to stay in the boreal forest then you have to plan a trip to the boreal forest if you want to see them so usually that means going to places like the Adirondacks or um, the Algonquin uh, National Park in Canada, Canada um, yeah. or if it's a good year like this year then you get all excited and you're like there's going to be evening gross beaks at my feeders in my backyard or the cemetery is going to have common red poles and you know you get it sort of makes the winter that all these cool bright colorful finches are suddenly going to take over your local park so this year has been especially given you know how tough this year's been it's definitely been really awesome that we got so lucky with this finch eruption year uh, and Carolyn Jones add, uh, added our evening grosbeaks part of this eruption. Yes, right? They're part of the, the finch eruption. Yeah, evening grosbeaks are in, they're also a finch. I know that the name, there are a lot of grosbeaks, but yeah, evening grosbeaks are finches. And they, um, it's actually really interesting because they really like eating spruce budworm, which is this burrowing worm that lives in the spruce forest, so up in Canada. And <laughs> there's been they these outbreaks of the spruce budworm go in cycles as well but they're much longer cycles so the evening gross peak population in the east had actually been getting lower but now there's this big spruce budworm outbreak in the boreal forest so this is one of the largest because the spruce budworm population is getting so large the evening gross peak population is also getting large because they rely on these spruce budworms and it was actually compounded by covid because the organization in Canada that would be spraying for the spruce budworm had to drastically reduce their spraying operations this year. So there was a lot more food in the boreal forest for the evening gross beaks. They had this bumper breeding year. And then immediately afterwards, the crop fit, you know, the, it finishes up. There's no budworms left because the, you know, they go either dormant, they, they fly off, there's no budworms for them. Then they can't find any food for the winter. And so we got evening gross beaks in Brooklyn. They're getting, they got evening gross beaks in Florida. I mean, they're all now, the entire East is starting to get these boreal evening gross beaks. Yeah, I saw on eBird that you can also see them uh, where we are here in Ulster County. Um, they're in the Catskills as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, it's nice to have these, uh, these cyclical years, especially like you said, to kind of brighten up the winter a little bit. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, they're, they're, and then- they're not, they're, Oh, no, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to just add, if people want to know how to see these birds, there's actually like ways that it's easier that's a little counterintuitive. So oh. it's, yeah, essentially all you have to do is just go to towns with feeders. You So you don't want to just go hiking in the woods because if there's no food for the birds, then you won't be able to find them. But if you go to a place with like a feeder or ornamental berries, you know, crab apple trees, for example, or even uh, nor like 
Christmas tree farms. I don't know. Wherever you could find a lot of this this food is where you're going to end up finding these finches. I don't know about Christmas tree farms. I sort of made that up. But um, so that's my secret is is look, it's counterintuitive. So look in, in towns with feeders and ornamental fruit trees is where we should all be birding this uh, this winter. Cool. Um, I'm going to post a, a resource list after the talk and I'm going to add that um, to the list. Uh, that's great. Um, that reminded me of a question and I can't remember uh, what I was going to ask, but I'll go back to the list. Um, uh, oh, uh, one quick thing I wanted to note about that um, is just if you're based in the Catskills region, um, Starting uh, in December, the, the New York State DEC, um, they, uh, they say it's, it's okay to put feeders back out um, because of bears. Uh, they recommend that people don't put feeders out from about April through November. Um, I'll include a link to that as well uh, after the talk. Um, but yeah, we're back in the time when people can use feeders. In this awesome. Region. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a question uh, about the Feminist Bird Club. Um, I was wondering uh, how you first learned about it and how you first got involved. Yeah, so I first learned about the Feminist Bird Club because I, as a relatively newer birder, took a New York City, well, it was just a National Audubon Society walk for queer birders with the, uh, Martha Harbison was the leader. And uh, they were really awesome and the walk like was super fun and just kind of plugged me into, you know, this, I didn't, I hadn't, I just hadn't realized that there were other young, like queer, interesting birders in the area. I mean, obviously there's all, I like birders. I like all the birders I meet in the field who are friendly and nice, but I just, I just hadn't known. I mean, I was a new birder and I had no idea. And then suddenly, you know, it was just introduced to all these like really welcoming, friendly people. And then just through that experience started to meet more and more birders. And then uh, I think that I probably read the same New York Times article that everybody else read a couple of years ago about the Feminist Bird Club and was just like, oh my God, like, I can't believe it. There's, you know, I always thought that birding like was this way. And now I know that, you know, there's actually places for, you know, just younger birders in cities to just kind of meet up and kind of unplug from the grind and uh, just, started to get friendly with a lot of the folks there. I started seeing them on walks more and more. And, uh, you know, I guess the rest is history that I just like, I liked it so much that I just knew I wanted to be a part of it. So I decided that I wanted to volunteer my time and, you know, help out where I could to sort of kind of grow the Feminist Bird Club. I'm also wearing my Feminist Bird Club hat right now, which is uh, really, I really love it. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. What species of, uh, what species of bird is that? It's a Labrador duck, which is an extinct duck, but the Feminist Bird Club, it just says it on the back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, my colleague actually wrote about the Labrador duck. She used to live in Elmira, New York, where I think it was um, uh, stated for a long time that that was the last sighting uh, in, of the Labrador duck in Elmira. Um, that's cool, that's, that's really neat. Uh, uh, her book is, uh, she's, her name is Kelly Huggins, if anyone's interested. Um, her book is called Curiosities of Elmira, New York, I think. Um, anyway, uh, speaking about the Feminist Bird Club, um, one of the things that they, um, they talk about in their, um, in their uh, kind of mission statement or on their website is uh, making birding a more inclusive activity. Um, and I was wondering uh, what, what inclusive birding looks like to you. Um, how can we make birding more inclusive? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a ton of ways. I think that one way is just making it really easy for folks to join bird walks, having bird walks that are in as many places as possible, um, that are open and not talking down to people, making them really welcoming for folks of really all backgrounds and experiences, um, especially leading bird walks in areas that may not have access to uh, bird guides, you know, that still have parks and green spaces to go birding. Um, and then just being really like, like giving and, you know, when you see folks who kind of share the interest of birding or being outside to really nurture it and 
not be condescending, not be gatekeepy, just like really let, you really want birding to be sort of this open place where people can take part in it. Um, and I think that like, even mentoring is super important. Um, finding folks who like, being a willing to be a mentor to to newer birders and younger birders, I think is also really important. And, you know, trying to like reach out actively to communities that might not traditionally be into birding or the outdoors, I don't know what that means, but just like being really opening and offering your expertise and offering your, you know, your just time to, to newer birders and to really, and not being judgmental at all to the kind of folks who come in there, as long as they're treating the birds nice. Totally. Um, those are all wonderful things that we should all be doing and inspiring to. Um, uh, I wanted to hop back um, on the uh, comments because uh, I saw that there were a couple that I didn't get to on here. Um, so Bethany uh, asks, uh, why are red cross bills your favorite? Well, they're my favorite for a lot of reasons. Um, so the, the the first reason is if you've ever watched the web cartoon Homestar Runner, which is like a millennial, you know, late, early 2000s flash cartoon, there's a character who has this really strong underbite who was my favorite character when I was, you know, 10 years old. And he, they kind of look similar. They have like a cross bill with the underbite. <laughs> <laughs> but the other reason is just like, they're super interesting. Like you see them and they, are you know they, they they're just weird looking like they're a bird that relies on conifers but they and they they undergo these eruptions which i think is really interesting and then there's also this it's still under development sort of what's going on with them but they might be rather than having subspecies they have what's called call types <clears throat> where birds with the same basically that make the same chipping note when they're flying will stay with the same birds make the same chipping note so for what we know in the, in the uh, North America, there are 10 of these call types, but these call types, there's evidence that their bills are actually adapted to different cone trees. So that like some of them might like lodgepole pine, some of them might like ponderosa pine and then or Sitka spruce. And then they, in one case, one of these call types ended up being its own species. It's now called the Casha cross bill in Idaho. And it's endemic to the state of Idaho. These birds rely on these lodgepole pine forests that uh, don't have any red squirrels in them. And I just think that's so interesting that there's so much to learn about this bird where if you just looked at two of them, you know, you just be like, okay, it's a little red bird with a cross bill. I get it. It's it, it, They all look the same, but then there's just, it just goes so deep and all of this knowledge and interesting stuff that you could uncover. I also am on a mission to make them the official bird of Christmas. I'm Jew I'm Jewish, <laughs> but we do have a Christmas tree. There is a red cross bill in the Christmas tree. It's up here. Um, oh, cool. And there, I think that it's the perfect Christmas bird because they love the North, they're around during Christmas time. They are a symbol of togetherness and they're red, which apparently they have to be red to be a Christmas bird. So there's all sorts of reasons. Uh, well, I wasn't gonna skip ahead um, to showing two of your favorite photographs that you've taken, um, but you included a red cross bill on here. So I was just going to share screen for a second to, uh, to show folks this picture of a red cross bill. Sure, I could even put a second. My two pictures can be two pictures of red cross bills. I have a lot. Oh, cool. Oh, they are both. They're both red cross bills, the two pictures. Oh, they are both perfect. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, actually. I'm going to check. Um, yeah, I just put in a second. There are two photos there. So now that, yeah. So this uh, one is many things open here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so this is the picture if you guys can see. Um, but I <laughs> I should have done this <laughs> a little <laughs> bit differently. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there you go. Yeah. So I love this beautiful picture. Beautiful photograph. Thank you. So this is a um, the, the the yellow ones. 
are usually the females, but I don't remember if this one had a couple splotches of red in it, which would mean that it was an immature male, but uh, just because I'm looking from far away. But this, uh, I love this picture because the bird is just so like intent on this cone that it's in and this, and so this is, I believe a black pine tree, which is um, a non-native pine tree that's really common on the coast of uh, Long Island. And so these black pine trees are actually one of the first crossbills when the Eastern call type that we have, they breed in the boreal forest and the Adirondacks, but if the cone crops fail, then a lot of them will head to Long Island and look for these cone crops here. And so this was in a tree at one of my local parks and she was just right low in the tree intent on eating some of these cones. And I was just really excited to, uh, really excited to get up and close with it. And a lot of them, they, they're, 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 they're somewhat tame. You can kind of walk up to them I mean, you don't want to get too close to them because you don't want to disturb their activity. But, you know, she didn't mind that I was just standing there and taking a couple of photos. That's great. Um, I'm going to come back to some photography questions. Um, I was wondering uh, what you recommend for um, birders, uh, birders who are basically just getting started or, or maybe things that you um, you bring with you birding that people might not think of? Yeah, I think so. The, for the first question, <clears throat> for birders who are just getting started, mm -hmm. I think that a really helpful thing to know is just what birds are in your area. Um, it's really daunting right at the start to look and be like, there's 10,000 bird species. Well, the good news, which is that, you know, you're not going to get 10,000 bird species in your backyard. <laughs> You'll probably get, you know, a couple dozen, but there are a lot of resources um, such as Cornell's eBird website, um, where you can basically just look in your area to see what the kind of birds that have been seen recently are. You can break it down by county, by your local park. And this is a huge citizen science project where all of the bird watchers in the world are basically reporting the sightings that they're having. Um, and yeah, if you familiarize yourself with the birds that are nearby, then you can cut that list down from the 10,000 birds or the thousand birds in your country to you know, a more manageable list of maybe the 50 birds that you would be likely to see in the month of December in, you know, upstate New York. And mm -hmm. once you have that list, then you can actually go in and start <clears throat> practicing your identification skills, li listening to them. But that was the really, you know, I, I don't think at any point, I, I, I don't, I mean, I don't really think I'm an expert in birds really beyond my local patch or, you know, New York State, really. I mean, I think that I just like really have been trying to get down as best as I can the birds that are expected in the areas that I go bird watching. And then, uh, what do I take with me birding? Um, I am a bike birder, so we. Uh, I I don't have a car unless I rent one, uh, and so I am always mobile on my bike, which is actually really useful for these crossbills because the place where I've been finding them is actually a um, decommissioned airport, an airstrip in South Brooklyn called Floyd Bennett Field. And they kind of range over this really big area of pine trees. So the way that I'll wait, I'll find my crossbills is I'll sit kind of in the exact middle on a berm um, right at the main entrance of this air, this airfield, and then just sit and listen because they, when they're when they're eating, they're really hard to find because as you saw in my picture, they're kind of buried in those pine trees. But once they fly, they make that call type that lets them know, you know, we're all crossbills, we're all type 10 crossbills. Uh, and then I hear them and then I can go bike over to them and then I can sort of follow them back and forth by bike instead of, you know, having to run over sort of the length of an airport or a runway just to go find my birds. <laughs> if I remember correctly, it's also kind of hard to get to Floyd Bennett Field having the bike it seems like a great way to, um, like the public transportation is difficult going out there, I think, right? Um, yeah, I think from my house, it's maybe like an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and 30 minutes by public transit and then an hour by bike. So in a lot of places in where I go birding in New York, it's in fact quicker to get there by bike than it is by public transit. Um, and in uh, the Catskills region, uh, you said that you've birded um, in, uh, did you say you birded Slide Mountain before or uh, other regions, North South Lake Campground? So 
I hiked Slide Mountain and I was just at the start of my birding life. And so I didn't know what treasures await. Slide Mountain is actually a well-known breeding spot for a, a pretty rare bird called the Bicknell's thrush, um, mm -hmm. who breeds in a lot of those high peaks in the Catskills. And I was not, I got to go back. So it gives me another reason to go back. But I have been birding uh, here at the North South Lake Campground, where I saw a lot of the sort of local uh, New York summertime breeders, birds like, you know, red-eyed vireo, yellow-throated vireo, um, northern perilla, those kinds of birds. And then in um, one of my favorite areas to breed in the Catskills region is the Shawangunk grasslands. Mm -hmm. uh, so as I guess that's a pattern that I really love abandoned airports, but <laughs> <laughs> Shawangunk is amazing both in the fall, in the, in the summertime and in the wintertime, because in the summertime, it's this huge grassland and you can see Birds that are not quite as common elsewhere in the state, like bobolink, uh, grasshopper sparrow, eastern meadowlark. Um, I saw a blue-winged warbler when I was there, and it's just in you know it's so vast, and it's just like it feels like there's like limitless potential for the kind of stuff you could see there. And of course, in the winter time, there are the northern harriers. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, in the winter time, there are the northern harriers, um, and then of course. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but of course it's one of the best spots in the state to see short-eared owls, uh, which, you know, there's usually a crowd of people there, kind of all, but they all stay by the blinds and the main, like, platform I've seen. It doesn't, I don't think people are out there like harassing the owls. No, I, um, no, I, I would say that too. People seem to be really respectful there. Um, and it's so National Wildlife Refuge, so you can't right. really stray like beyond the path um, yeah, I, I second that totally. It's a wonderful place to bird, uh, show on, on grasslands. Um, there were some owl, owl sightings uh, that were pretty widely reported um, in some places in Manhattan recently. Um, are there some dangers in getting more, many people excited to see birds and how can we be respectful birders? I think that there is, in my opinion, there it's not you don't want to disturb a bird's behavior because you don't know what undue stress you might be causing the bird, um, especially with birds that are sort of right at the edge of their range, they're eruptive, that might be struggling to find food or things like that. Um, owls in New York City are kind of a good example of those birds that I understand that owls are amazing. Um, and if I found an owl in Brooklyn, I would like lose it. I'd be so excited and I would just want to tell the world. And I think that, you know, there's, I think that this is a big debate and I've been really, I think that especially in Central Park right now, it's upsetting to see that there's kind of always a huge crowd of people kind of mobbing the two or three owls that have shown up there. And it's hard not to get upset by those, um, if you're a birder and you really care about sort of the well-being of these birds to say, well, we shouldn't really be all there surrounding this owl who's just trying to hunt and, you know, doesn't really know any better, doesn't know what the point of people. And, you know, you don't know, you, you, I just, like I said, I don't like changing the bird's behavior if I don't have to. Um, yeah. And so it's just, an, it's an interesting sort of dilemma because it's also the most, the most pop, you know, this is like the most popular city in the country. And, there's a lot of um, people who really want to see owls. And I think for a lot of people, owls are the bird that makes them excited about bird watching, right? Because True. they're such amazing, majestic birds are so, just so mysterious and interesting. And, you know, I, I don't have the answer personally, because I think that people should be able to see owls. But I think that to report widely the look, exact tree that an owl's in, in Central Park is naturally going to draw a crowd and potentially a you know, be stressful for the owl. So yeah, I don't have the right, any any real answers, is, is, but what I can say is that, you know, I, I personally have not gone to Manhattan this year because of COVID, but also because not, I don't want to add to the owl bonanza, but I think that it's really important. And what I think a lot of Brooklyn birders have been doing is just to really try and mentor younger birders on the, especially on the open tours, right? That we have these walks that are free uh, and they happen not just the Feminist Bird Club, but you know, there's the Brooklyn Bird Club as well. And they have free walks. And on these walks, they really sort of talk about these issues and what it means to 
see an owl and and what kind of can happen if a big crowd of people ends up mobbing an owl like that. And uh, I think just being a really good mentor to people and really teaching them early on what sort of teaching kind of what's going on with these owls and how to be respectful around them and how to not add to the trouble of the owl uh, is just really important. And I'm glad that we do have that resource in Brooklyn. That's great. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's important. An important thing to note is that we can um, we can learn about bird species and identification, but also we should learn about what their kind of um, their homeostasis is, like what is their um, their ideal condition, and, and not try to disturb that. Um, but you're right; it is kind of a controversial topic because people do get really excited about owls, and that's that's a good thing on most le most uh, on most levels. Yeah, I think my answer to that is just <clears throat> people should go to Shawangunk <laughs> because it's a place where, I mean, it's hard to get to for Manhattan, obviously, but if you can, um, I suggest trying to get up there. It's a way to see owls in their native habitat. They're hunting, you know, they're, they're not, you're not disturbing them by, you can't find their roost because they're hidden in the grasslands. Um, that could be a good start or just going and going out different places at night and trying and hearing them going, you know, I don't want to suggest that people go hiking in Central Park at night because that's not that's not what I'm here to talk about. But just like trying to find owls in their native habitats and trying to observe them in respectful ways. Totally. Well said. Uh, let me see if uh, we have any new questions here. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, for watching tonight. Um, and uh, please feel free to drop any questions that you have for Ryan about birding or about birds um, in the comment box. Let's see. Oh, um, earlier on, Carolyn Jones uh, asked, how far south did you see fishes? Um, they're in uh, South Central Pennsylvania. Oh, are there finches in South Central Pennsylvania? Is that the question? Yeah. Oh, um, well. Or some yes. of the finches. I think, I think Carolyn was talking about the winter finches. Uh. Yeah. Um, so definitely it depends on the species. Uh, if you go out birding, that's, I haven't checked the eBird recently for South Central Pennsylvania, but almost certainly you'll be able to see uh, pine siskins, which is one of the eruptive winter finches. Um, definitely keep your ears open for red crossbills in the pine stands. Uh, keep your eyes open at feeders for evening gross beaks and common red poles. Um, they're all possibilities right now, um, especially in the Northeast. Uh, the further south you go, the less likely that they'll be. But even down, I mean, there have been red crossbill sightings down into the Southeast. Um, there have been, like I said, evening gross beaks reported in Florida. So you really only know if you get out birding and if you check eBird. Totally, yeah, eBird is a great resource. Um, uh, do you have a favorite field guide? Yes, I do. I use the Sibley's field guide on my phone and I love it. It's, um, I was just telling my brother today cause I just made him buy it today that it's, uh, I used to really love the Nat Geo field guide cause I, it's, I just loved sitting in front of a field guide and like flipping through the pages and getting really excited about reading. But when I'm out in the field, it's it's really amazing because you can kind of really quickly just say like, oh, I saw a finch and you type in finch and you're like, okay, well now it's giving me all these birds with the word finch in their name. So which of them is it gonna be? And um, there's a compare feature. So you could see if compare like two similar birds and uh, it gives you how likely the bird will be seen in your state. It's really good for basically doing what I was talking about earlier, which is just kind of making that list of the common birds in your area. So you can filter just say birds in New York state seen in December that are common or uncommon. Um, it's something you can do in the Sibley's app. So I'm really excited about the Sibley's app. That's awesome. I have never tried that. Um, I use the Audubon app uh, and eBird, but I've never tried the Sibley's app. That's great. Um, uh, Audubon's good too. I should. I, I have friends who no. <laughs> work at Audubon. And it's it's also a good app. It's they're all great. But Sibley's, is there's just something very crisp and clean about that app that it makes it it's like a joy to use both when I'm out birding and when I'm home. You know, not leaving the house.
Totally. Um, you mentioned uh, winter birding, and you've answered this. To, you've answered this already a little bit. Um, but uh, what kinds of birds are you excited to see this time of year? Um, I think sometimes people think of birding as a three-season activity: spring, summer, and fall. Um, do you recommend winter birding? I think of birding as a three-season activity: spring, winter, fall. Summer is too hot. I want to stay home. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, <laughs> yeah, although summer is actually quite good for like shorebirds and wading birds, of course, but it's too hot for me. Winter, however, is I come alive in the winter, especially because I'm married to somebody from far northwestern Minnesota, basically on the border with North Dakota. Uh, I have in the past few years been doing my Christmas bird counts in North Dakota and in Minnesota, and the winter birding there is like just so different. I mean, there are basically all the stuff that like i really hope i might be able to see in new york state you you just they, it's kind of common there um birds like rough-legged hawks and northern shrikes and uh, all of these finches but i'm so excited for this winter especially because of the eruption going on it really feels like there's so much potential i've already gotten uh the only finches that I haven't seen in Brooklyn of the eruptive the eruptive bunch is I still need white wing crossbill, pine grosbeak, which is never going to happen because they rarely come this far south. Uh, I need the red poles, and then I really want to see bohemian waxwing, which is like a cedar waxwing, but they're like really plump and tubby. They're sort of starling sized and really raucous, almost like like college students of birds. They're really really fun. <laughs> Um, but I really want to see one of those in New York State. I've only seen them in North Dakota. Um, cool. Yeah, they're really cute. Uh, we had a, at least 50, if not 100, cedar wax wings at the Catskills Visitor Center recently. It was it was wonderful. Um, like a nice yeah. morning on our, our nature trail. Uh, but I've never seen a bohemian wax wing. That's very cool. They'll blow your mind. They're so funny. It's just like cedar wax wings are amazing. And I love, I mean, of all of the birds that I kind of see whenever I go out, they're the ones that I always spend the most time on because they're always feeding each other and like they're so raucous and just acting so silly. But then if you put a bohemian wax wing in the mix, like I'm telling you, it's like somebody drew a circle and then put a crest on it. They're, they're just so, they're so jolly. They're just like, there's something about them that really kind of imparts this like, silly friendly winter spirit about these birds i don't know there's it's just a whole different it's a whole weird experience seeing them they're both um, amazing cedar wax wings are also amazing but yeah totally i love cedar wax wings someone wrote in that they also love love the wax wings uh what what's a good habitat for a bohemian wax wing so they act similar to the pine grosbeaks, which means that you have to look for uh, ornamental fruit trees. So like crab apple trees, um, sometimes I think holly, I'm not really sure about the other ones. Just like the way that we've traditionally done it on the Christmas bird counts in Minnesota has been, we just slowly drive around like suburban neighborhoods or rural areas with homes and then see if any of them have ornamental fruit trees. And then uh, just kind of stick around slowly going from fruit tree to, tree to fruit tree. You're not going to make yourself a lot of friends doing this. People will kind of ask you, like, why are you slowly driving around my neighborhood? Um, with binoculars. But with binoculars. <laughs> don't, don't, you don't, I mean, you, we should also be good people on top of being good to the wildlife. Like, I don't want to promote, like, obviously, like, private property is a real thing. Like, don't, we can get into that later. But we should, you know, at the same time, it's like if somebody is, like if you're driving down the street and you see somebody's driveway is full of crab apple trees and you see movement in the crab apple tree, it's definitely good to like just just park your car and see what might be going on there because you could be rewarded with a bohemian wax wing or a cedar wax wing. And that's especially true um, sort of right this in this time period in the winter in an eruption year like this in the Catskills and North. That's great. Um, some good things to look out for, uh, even in neighborhoods. You don't necessarily have to be in the woods taking a hike, just be around where you live. Um, let's see if we have any questions. Uh, someone said, did Ryan mention his bird Christmas ornaments? Yes, uh, we, saw, <laughs> we saw they're the all here. 
I have a common red pole here. I have a red crossbill, barn owl. This is a winter wren. It was great. I bought it on eBay. I couldn't believe it. I was literally Googling, <laughs> Googling crossbill ornaments. And then suddenly I was blessed with this entire stock of 25 Christmas tree ornaments. That's wonderful. I think you've just given me some Christmas ideas. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I bought some um, bird patches for my boyfriend for his birthday. Um, they have a they have a short-eared owl patch, actually. I think it's on uh, birdcollective.com. Oh, cool. So some more um, Christmas ideas for people. Yeah, they're Brooklyn birders too. So I've been trying to convince, when I see them out, I try and convince them that they should be making more Finch merchandise. I'm not there yet, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get them there. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a question about uh, the great gray owl. Um, did you see a great gray owl when you were in Minnesota? <sighs> no, and I'm still bitter about it, but it just didn't, it didn't connect. We were, we were sort of looking, but we weren't in quite the right habitat where we were looking. Uh, the last time I was there, I was looking more for greater prairie chicken um, because we were in sort of the more prairie habitat. Mm -hmm. um, but this year was supposed to be the year that I was going to go get my great gray owl and Northern Hawk Owl in Northern Minnesota. So I'll have to wait until next year or get lucky. Who knows, maybe one will, you know, appear in my next trip to the Adirondacks or something, but no, not yet. But thank you for asking. Cause I really want to see them. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, go back to my list of questions here. Um, do you recommend any resources for learning bird calls? I use that Sibley's app um, is mainly what I do. And also I find that I really am best learning the bird calls when I hear it come from the bird itself. So watching YouTube videos, seeing it on the app, that stuff is helpful, but I just, I think the only real way to do it is just go out and, and go birding and, and really try and see the bird make the sound because then you'll kind of develop that connection between the bird making the sound and, and the bird. It's, I think, uh, that's been most helpful for me is just really keep my ears open recording birds on my iPhone. You can just use your iPhone's voice recorder feature to record birds. Um, but yeah, just go birding as much as you can. I think is maybe not a, not a satisfying answer, but that's the answer I got. Well, that's definitely a good answer. Um, I think I had a question on here about um, binoculars. Yes, I have my whole optics set up right next to me if you wanna see. Oh, cool. Yes, please. OK, so the binoculars that I use are not expensive. They're well, they're not that expensive. They're only 100 bucks or 120 maybe. They're called oh, the Cel bad. Yeah, and they're really good. They're the Celestron Nature DX 8x42s. Um, they people will argue over whether 8x42 or 10x42 is better. 10s, they have more zoom, but a smaller field of view. I find the 8x42s are, are fine. Um, I also have a Feminist Bird Club uh, binocular strap that I'm really excited about. <laughs> um, I would say that you, that comfort is also really important. So like, don't be afraid to like just dress really comfortable in sweatpants and yeah. or fashionable. Like, just be yourself when you're out birding because there's not too many people just wearing khakis. Like, I get the appeal, but you should like just be yourself out there and like try and try and own it, I guess. But be comfortable. I have like a I have like a very ugly sort of harness that I sometimes wear with my binoculars so that my back doesn't hurt. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll I guess we'll put it in the resources at the end. The binoculars that I recommend, like I said, oh, they're yeah. affordable and the optics are really good. Um, so I can't complain. Um, yeah, that's super so, affordable for for really good birding binoculars. And then I guess you want my camera set up too. Oh, only if you want to share it. Um, I was wondering about lenses <laughs> specifically. Oh, <ooh. laughs> yeah, that looks like a nice Canon. <laughs> yeah, so I shoot with a Canon uh, 7D Mark II. Um, we can get, there's a whole like universe of photography to get into um, and a yeah. lot of questions that you have to ask yourself about what your budget is, uh, what your goal is. Do you just want record shots or do you want like really sort of in-depth photography shots. Um, so the lens I use is the, it's the 100 to 400 lens. So that's the focal length It's from 100 millimeters to 400 millimeters and it zooms. So that's probably the most popular 
birding lens just because it both is a really good lens for taking pictures, but also it's not heavy enough to like break your back when you're walking around with it. And then the 7D Mark II is the camera body I use. I like it because it's pretty rugged. Um, I'm very clumsy. So if I, I've dropped it a couple times and it has not, well, I haven't dropped it bad, but I've sort of dropped it from like this level and it hasn't uh, failed me yet. It also is a crop sensor. Um, we can get into what a full sensor versus a crop sensor is, but it can be really useful for wildlife photography because essentially what that means is that you just get a little okay. extra zoom out of the camera than you would just with the lens alone. Totally. Um, yeah, that's a good consideration going with full frame camera versus a, a crop sensor camera. Yeah. But it's nice and then to there, get yeah. that, that extra um, telephoto with the crop sensor. Totally. And there's other cameras. I mean, there's also these bridge cameras. I know somebody who shoots with a Sony bridge camera, which is one where it has the lens built in already. Um, and she gets some really beautiful photos. I think that, huh. you know, there's all sorts of, it's, there's a lot, you can really stay up at night stressing over your camera setup. So if you want to take the plunge, you know, feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'll help you <laughs> go through my anxieties. <laughs> Ryan will help you go into that rabbit hole uh, if you have questions about camera lenses. That's awesome, thank you. Um, we had a question come in um, about uh, cats. Um, oh, uh, it's a, a statement about cats. Um, another reason to keep your cats in, red poles are totally naive about the cats. I had to put up barriers on my deck years ago to stop the neighbor's cat from pouncing on red, red poles under the feeder. Yeah, that's a totally. great reminder. Um, I remember not too long ago, there was a report that the one of the number one killers of, of native species of birds was cats. Um, so if you want to be a friend of birds, uh, I think keeping your cats indoors is probably a good way to go. Yeah, I also have a cat and she is totally an indoor cat. But I would also add that, you know, you can, there, there are people who've built like, they call them catios. So an in sort of outdoor cat enclosure. Um, for people who are like, my cat has to be outside. Well, you could just just make sure that there is a barrier completely around the cat. So like basically an aviary, but for your cat so that there's uh, no way that your cat can get the birds. That's true of a lot of the winter finches, especially red poles are a good example because they're often on the ground or low to the ground. Um, but a lot of, you know, they're all really docile. I mean, you could walk up to a tree with a pine grow speak on it and sort of just like kind of get really up in there and they won't fly away. Uh, someone asked about the Catskills Visitor Center. Does the Catskills Visitor Center offer bird watching walks in the area? Um, so we we do normally. Um, with COVID, we have pretty much stopped doing um, in person events. Um, but uh, in the future, absolutely, when COVID is a little bit less of a, a safety risk, um, we uh, we hope we host with the the DEC every year um, an, an event called Outdoors Day. It happens at the beginning of June, and we usually have a bird walk during that event. Um, also, we send people pretty often to the John Burroughs Natural History Society, which is um, a great group uh, right in our area that does bird walks. Um, the Feminist Bird Club does bird walks. Uh, and um, also, I'm going to include a link to um, the Audubon chapters in New York uh, at the end of the program. And um, those Audubon chapters do usually uh, have regular bird walks. So those are a couple of um, couple of good places to, to look into. Uh, yeah. Hopefully we will do in the future, go back to, to doing in-person bird walks. Winter is also the best time to take on bird watching because A, there's not as many people there if you're looking for that sort of solitude and B, because there's so many fewer birds, it really gives you the opportunity to learn about some of the native, you know, these the ones who are always here. Um, yeah. And that way you, if you're out birding in the migratory season when there's a lot of warblers, then you know, oh, that sound was a cardinal. Like, that's great. I love cardinals, but you know, I already know what it is. Or, you know, just being able to recognize your sights and your sounds will make it really easy when, or a lot easier when there's a lot of unfamiliar stuff that shows up. Yeah, totally. Um, that's a great point. Uh, we only have another few minutes, um, so I just wanna make sure uh, I didn't miss any questions. Um, if you have any questions for Ryan about birds, please feel free to drop it in the comment box and thank you so much to everyone who is uh, viewing this right now.
Um, let's see. Talk about lenses and cameras. Uh, what are some of the birding events during the year that people can get involved with? Um, do people have to be experienced birders to participate? I think that there's a lot of really awesome events for all levels of participation. One of the really good ones uh, that Cornell runs is, let me just make sure I get the name right, um, the Great Backyard Bird Count. So this one is definitely a, um, it's, it's a sort of more solitary activity. You're doing it in your own backyard, but it's just a really great way to uh, just start you know, there's a lot of resources that are available for learning about your backyard birds. Um, you know, obviously, like Livia said, just be on the lookout for bird walks in your local area. A lot of parks will have them. Just look online and see. And then if you're ever in Brooklyn, you know, the Brooklyn Bird Club offers uh, several walks, I mean, a month, if not one. Of, I think it's at least one a week. So there's a lot of opportunities to just get out there. And then you eventually get to a point where if you're out bird birding enough, you know, you just see somebody else with binoculars and you say, oh, see anything good? That's sort of like the bird watcher way of saying hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty silly. <laughs> no, it's good. Uh, that's, that's what you want to know, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, we were pretty excited um, that uh, a bird was rehabilitated here in um, Ulster County. Uh, you guys might have heard about it. Um, it was uh, a sawwet owl that was uh, transported from Oneonta to New York City in the Rockefeller Christmas tree. Um, the rehabilitator is called Ravensbeard Wildlife Center. It's here in um, Saugerties. Uh, do you have any recommendations for someone if they found an injured bird um, or have you have you done any rehabilitation of birds? I've transported a number of probably five or six birds at this point to a local rehab center. I think the, the really important thing is uh, just know there's a lot of things you can do. I think the first thing you should do is take preventative measures, especially folks who live out in the country uh, and even in the city, if you have big windows, um, you should consider ways to treat them so the birds don't fly into them. That includes, um, there are bird safe glass options, which it can also just mean putting up a lot of stickers that are closely spaced so that birds don't uh, fly into them. Um, this is especially important for buildings that are on the lower levels, uh, the lower, I believe 75 feet um, in support, you know, groups that are trying to install bird safe glass or pass laws that require bird safe glass. Uh, in terms of rehabilitation, if you see a bird that is um, injured, the first thing you do is call somebody who's more experienced than you to ask them what you should be doing, and they'll yeah. usually give you options. Um, but I think that if just know that if a bird flies into a window and is seems okay, it may not be okay. So it's often best to you know put them into like a dark space, like a box, let them chill out for a while while they're in shock. And then, um, yeah, bring them to a licensed rehabilitator. I once brought a house finch that flew into a window and was freezing in the snow, like 300 miles from Northwestern Minnesota to South Central Minnesota, because it was the closest uh, rehabilitation center. And it was okay, <laughs> I think. <laughs> That's great. Uh <laughs> Maybe it's like 200 miles. It wasn't that far. It was like a three hour, four hour drive. It was definitely a very far journey for this poor little house finch. <laughs> did they take it back uh, north or did you, uh... <laughs> House finches are an interesting bunch. I'm sure the bird was, would have been fine unless, I mean, I felt bad because she was without her husband at that point, but I'm sure that she was, you know, as soon as she was let out, she found a feeder in the area and was probably just fine there. She was very cute. I have pictures. Cool. Um, well, uh, definitely check out Ryan Mandelbaum's uh, Flickr page um, for some really fantastic uh, bird photos. Check out Bird Moto on Gizmodo. Um, and, uh, and also stay tuned for the list of resources that I'm going to post um, after the talk uh, about places to bird in Ulster County, some other information, um, uh, towns with feeders. And thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. Um, thank you to Ryan so much for being here and for answering all of uh, my questions.
my questions and of uh, uh, viewers' questions. And I yeah. hope you have a happy holiday. I love your Christmas tree and your bird ornaments. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks, yeah, thanks so much, everybody who tuned in. It was really great questions, and I really had a good time. And thanks, Olivia, for having me. Yeah, of course. Thank you, too. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.